How's everybody feeling? Come on, look at me. I like got this whole thing made for you. I'm excited to be here, honored and feeling so blessed to be in your presence. Um, happy Saturday, it's so beautiful outside. I'm from Toronto and so the sun is just, <laughs> I'm crying all the time. <laughs> so nice. Um, I'm gonna share some poems with you. But before I begin, I wanna ask, how many of you have been to a poetry reading before? Okay, cool, so we're pros here. Um, but then you know the drill. When a poet's on stage and they're saying something that you're really feeling, how do you let them know? Exactly. But you know, if you really like what they're saying, I'm gonna need you to clap, hoot and holler, make all the noise, because when you give me your energy, I'm able to give you even more in return. And this whole thing, I think for me as a performer, I love doing it because of the exchange. And so give me all your vibes and I'm gonna share it with you. Thank you. The first piece that I want to perform is called The Art of Growing, and it was really inspired by the girl that I was when I was in eighth grade, and I had this major crush on this dude, boy, um, since I was like sixth grade. And finally, in eighth grade, we had lockers right next to each other. <laughs> and so I was like, great, we're going to get married. This is awesome. <laughs> so he ignored me all year, whatever. Um, and finally, one day, you know, he comes up to me, we start talking, we're by our lockers, and I'm like, oh my God, are we falling in love, <laughs> finally? <laughs> and at this point, he's asking me all these questions. You know, he has one arm over my shoulders, and I'm like, yes, we're about to make babies, cool, great. And then he looks into my eyes super dreamily, and he says, show me your boobs. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction. And you know, the shock wasn't because he had asked, because to be honest, I was okay with that. <laughs> the shock was because I had none. <laughs> like these babies did not come in until like the 12th grade. And so I was like, <laughs> wait, I'm all types of confused about my body. And also, what are you trying to see? And so I went home confused and boobless and aware of it and wondering what the hell is going on and what's happening. And so years and years later, I wrote this next piece called The Art of Growing for that girl that I was in eighth grade. And I hope you enjoy it. I felt beautiful until the age of 12 when my body began to ripen like new fruit. And suddenly, the men looked at my newborn hips with salivating lips. The boys, they didn't want to play tag at recess. They wanted to touch all the new and unfamiliar parts of me. The parts I didn't know how to wear, didn't know how to carry, tried to bury in my ribcage. Boobs, they said. And I hated that word. Hated that I was embarrassed to say it, that even though it was referring to my body, it didn't belong to me. It belonged to them. And they repeated it like they were meditating upon it. Let me see yours. There is nothing worth seeing here but guilt and shame. I try to rot into the earth below my feet, but I'm still standing one foot across from his hooked fingers. And when he charges to feast on my half moons, I bite into his forearm and decide that I hate this body, that I must have done something terrible to deserve it. So when I go home, I tell my mother that the men outside were starving. She tells me I must not dress with my breasts hanging, said the boys will get hungry if they see fruit, said I should sit with my legs closed like a woman Ada, or the men will get angry and fight, said I can avoid all of this trouble if I just learn to act like a lady. But the problem is, that doesn't even make sense. I can't wrap my head around the fact that I have to convince half the world's population that my body is not their bed. 
I am busy learning the consequences of womanhood when I should be learning science and math instead. And I like cartwheels. I like cartwheels and gymnastics, so I can't imagine walking around with my thighs pressed together like they're hiding a secret as if the acceptance of my own body parts will invite thoughts of lust in their heads. I will not subject myself to your ideology because slut shaming is rape culture and virgin praising is rape culture and i am not a mannequin in the window of your favorite shop you can't dress me up or throw me out when i'm worn you are not a cannibal and your actions are not my responsibility so you will you will control yourself so the next time I go to school and the boys they hoot at my backside, I push them down, foot over their necks, and defiantly say, boobs. And the look in their eyes is absolutely priceless. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from The Sun and Her Flowers. Legacy. I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me thinking, what can I do to make this mountain taller so the women after me can see farther? Do we hate that one? Cool. I was like, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's called Girl Boss Rally. Come on. <laughs> it was when I stopped searching for home within others and lifted the foundations of home within myself, I found that there were no roots more intimate than those between a mind and a body that have decided to be whole. Thank you. <laughs> That's like the best when the baby support. <laughs> How do I shake this envy when I see you doing well, sister? How do I love myself enough to know that your accomplishments are not my failures? We are not each other's competition. Thank you. I think that's really, even for me, like, I write that and I believe it and I support it, but we still have those days where, you know, we go online and we, you know, it's not our best day and we don't feel pretty and we don't feel good and we're not motivated and we're not able to look at all the things we've accomplished and be like, wow, I'm really proud of myself. And then you see everybody else online doing amazing, incredible things and we let that sort of dampen our spirits and that's, I feel like a lot of like tension builds, but I always remind myself that hold on, when one person rises, when one woman rises, we all rise. And so it's so important to show up and to celebrate all women. Because no one else is gonna do it for us. Like the system was not built to uplift us. And so really we gotta build that system for each other. And this one is my favorite from the book. Mostly because I feel like I didn't write, the, write it, it just kind of landed in my head one day. I was like dreaming it, and then I woke up, and then I was like, thank you, God. <laughs> it's called Timeless. They convinced me I only had a few good years left before I was replaced by a girl younger than me. As though men yield power with age, but women grow into irrelevance. They can keep their lies, for I have just gotten started. I feel as though I just left the womb. My 20s are the warm-up for what I'm really about to do. Wait till you see me in my 30s. 
Now that will be a proper introduction to the nasty, wild woman in me. How can I leave before the party started? Rehearsals honestly begin at 40. I ripen with age. I do not come with an expiration date. And now for the main event. Curtains up at 50. Let's begin the show. Thank you. Thank you. You're an amazing, amazing audience. Thank you. Thank you. Seriously. Thank you. I haven't done this for a while. Like, I've kind of been off the road for a couple months, so it always feels a little weird to come back and be like, oh, will I mess up? What? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, how can I? It's hard to, like, I can't ignore all the goodness coming my way. So thank you for uplifting me and making me magical because I couldn't do it without you. So this next piece is called Broken English, and it's about kind of my experience as an immigrant myself, as a daughter of immigrants, and I remember growing up, it was always like, how can I not look like this? <laughs> Um, and what can I do to just sort of fit in as much as possible? And so something as small as going to the grocery store with my parents who didn't speak any English at all was always like really difficult because that's when it would sort of be out on display how different we are and how much we don't belong. And so we would get to the grocery store and immediately I would run away from my mom and I would like go to the candy aisle and I'd be hanging out in front of all this candy my mom would never let me buy. And eventually, you know, I would hear this lady screaming my name in Punjabi, which is our language, and I'd be like, oh my God, that's not my mom, I promise, even though she's the only brown woman in the store, it's fine, I'm adopted. Because <laughs> I would just be so embarrassed, because everybody else was like, who is this lady screaming at? And I'm like, no, this is just how we speak, we're just really expressive, you know? Um, and I remember being at the checkout line and my mom would pull out like this Ziploc bag with like change in it and she's paying and I'm like, oh, so embarrassing. Why you have to be so poor? And then I was like, oh, shoot. Years later, I realized, wow, how much beautiful strength is that that she chose to carry her money in a Ziploc bag just so that she could spend that $20 on a backpack for me. And so it took me, thank you. But, like, you don't have that understanding when you're nine. <laughs> you just want to be cool. Um, but it wasn't until, I don't know, years and years and years later that I finally began to embrace my identity. And I went from hating where I was, the language that I spoke, the food that I ate, and all of that, to finally embracing it. And when I embraced it, I began to see my parents' sacrifices as pieces of art and not marks of shame anymore. And when that happened, I wrote this next piece called Broken English. Think about the way my father pulled the family out of poverty without knowing what a vowel was. And my mother raised four children without being able to construct a perfect sentence in English. A discombobulated couple who landed in the new world with hopes that left the bitter taste of rejection in their mouths. No family no friends, just man and wife. Two university degrees that meant nothing. One mother tongue that was broken now. One swollen belly with a baby inside. A father worrying about jobs and rent. Cause no matter what, this baby was coming. And they thought to themselves, for a split second, was it worth it to put all of our money into the dream of a country that's swallowing us whole? And Papa looks at his woman's eyes and sees loneliness living where the iris was. Wants to give her a home in a country that looks at her with the word visitor wrapped around their tongue. On their wedding day, 
She left an entire village to be his wife. And now she left an entire country to be a warrior. And when the winter came, they had nothing but their own bodies to keep the coldness out. And so, like two brackets, they faced one another to hold the dearest parts of them, their children close. They turned a suitcase full of clothes into a life and regular paychecks to make sure the children of immigrants wouldn't hate them for being the children of immigrants. They work too hard. You can tell by their hands, their eyes were begging for sleep, but our mouths were begging to be fed. And that is the most artistic thing I have ever seen. It is poetry to these ears that have never heard what passion sounds like. And my mouth is full of likes and ums when I look at their masterpiece. Because there are no words in the English language that can articulate that kind of beauty. I can't compact their existence into 26 letters and call it a description. I tried once, but the adjectives needed to describe them don't even exist. So instead, I ended up with pages and pages full of words followed with commas and more words and more commas only to realize that there are some things in the world so infinite that they could never use a full stop so how dare you mock your mother when she opens her mouth and broken english spills out don't be ashamed of the fact that she split through countries to be here so you wouldn't have to cross a shoreline. Her accent is thick like honey. Hold it with your life. It's the only thing she has left from home. Don't you stomp on that richness. Instead, Hang it up on the walls of museums next to Dolly and Van Gogh. Her life is brilliant and tragic. Kiss the side of her tender cheek. She already knows what it sounds like to have an entire nation laugh when she speaks. She is more than our punctuation and language. We might be able to paint pictures and write stories, but she made an entire world for herself. So how is that for art? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. I love you, Mwah. bye. Thank you, thank you.